Good morning, everyone. My name is Tata Moahi. I'm an agricultural scientist and agripreneur from South Africa. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Rural and Marketing Development Thematic Platform Parallel Session. This session is dubbed Agri Ecosystems Development Enterprise. Please note the event is being recorded. By participating, you show your willingness to be recorded. We invite you to use the Q&A function to put any questions or comments forward, and the host will be in direct contact with you. You also have the option to raise a hand. You are all muted, and we will activate your microphone if you are putting up a question. We have measures in place to help maintain the integrity of the call. Should there be any disturbance, please do bear with us, and we will restore order shortly. There will be some interactive elements throughout the event. We would invite you to participate in polls and quizzes that will be launched during the cert through certain parts of the event. First, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, this year's AGRF key theme is Pathways to Recovery and Resilient Food Systems. Today's theme is Build Forward Better. African food security lies in its opportunity to link markets and add value to improve livelihoods of Africans. 80% of global multidimensional poverty occurs in rural areas. So it's essential to see that the agri-system as a continuum from the farm to the value added processing to products on the grocery store shelves. Leading academics, insightful business leaders, and finance experts will help us chart a course to more robust value chains on the continent. From farmers to aggregators, processors to retailers, this session is dubbed Agri-System Development Enterprise. We will speak about the interventions in logistics and marketing, as well as the means to get integrated value chains functioning more effectively in Africa. To discuss this, we will, having, we will be having three exciting sessions that are packed with insights and practical pathways to meet the day's themes objectives. To kick us off, we shall have two keynote presentations and without taking much time, it would be great to, it will be a great pleasure to welcome Her Excellency, Jira Dean Mukashimina, the Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources of Rwanda. She will be giving us the keynote address, Strengthening Mechanisms Post-2020. Excellencies, distinguished the participants following the EGRF 2021 Summit Online, I'm very pleased to be participating in this important session that is dedicated to smallholder farmers who make a large part of the raw markets. The COVID-19 pandemic has a defining moment for our food systems, and uh, it underscored the need to rethink our strategies. The core is still urgent. We must accelerate actions to transform our food systems to be more competitive, more resilient, and sustainable. Investing in rural markets is critical. We must strengthen the local markets, diversify food products, manage post-harvest losses, and invest in digital solutions to support smallholders. However, short supply chains are the key characteristics of traditional markets. Developing midstream and downstream agribusinesses create more opportunities and pathways to prosperity for agri SMEs and farmers. Value addition is still critical to support the transition to modern supply chains that support development and other sectors such as manufacturing and service industry. Connecting rural and urban food systems 
have the potential to not only guarantee food and nutrition security, but also to create rural employment that is decent and profitable. Strengthening value chains in rural markets will go a long way in creating more jobs, especially for our young people who make up to 60% of the continent's population. Furthermore, up to 76% of our country's working population is engaged in agricultural production. Agriculture is an important economic activity and an important source of foreign exchange, making up to 63% of the value of Rwanda's export. Our economic growth heavily relies on the growth of, of the agriculture sector. It has also been proven that agriculture sector is three times more effective in reducing poverty. We want to transform the agriculture sector from subsistence to a sustainable, value-creating, market-oriented food sector with expansive contributions to national output and food security of households. Our journey of transformation began over two decades ago with our Vision 2020, which was guided by the development of other national development frameworks, including medium-term economic and poverty reduction strategy, as well as other sector uh, strategic plans. We now have a new blueprint, a 30-year vision for the period up to 2050. In all these long-term development uh, frameworks, rural-urban linkages through transport infrastructures, storage processing facilities, and uh, integrated rural-urban development uh, plans have been developed and continue to be an integral part of the country's development journey. In Rwanda, we are investing in our smallholders working from the ground up. I will cite a few examples on how we are supporting our rural smallholders and growing the rural economy. Through the local authorities, we are constructing market infrastructures in every district and uh, in every village in the country. For the main crops, such as maize, uh, soybean, and others, we are creating market linkages uh, by linking farmers to industries and other buyers, such as uh, Africa Improved Foods, to process safe and nutritious food products. We are also building the capacity of our farmers to improve the quality of produce sold to markets. This includes value additions and uh, post-harvest management. Also, we are working with agribusinesses and markets to create an enabling market environment. At the beginning of the selling season, we hold meetings that bring stakeholders together to agree on prices. This ensures our farmers and buyers to have strong and value-based business relationships. We are also linking local producers to international markets to boost agricultural trade and expand market opportunities. An example is a youth uh, company called the Gashora Farms that sources chilies from farmers, processes it, and uh, sell it on our Alibaba platform. The government of Rwanda is collaborating with the private sector and it is investing in cold storage facilities to maintain good quality of horticultural products. The use of investment in technology and digital solutions have been one of the most positive outcome of the COVID-19 pandemic. The use of technology and uh, digital solutions have been one of the positive outcomes of the COVID-19 pandemic. 
these technologies supported continuing agricultural activities while reducing potential infections. In closing, I would like to request agribusinesses, governments, financial institutions, and providers of improved uh, agricultural technologies to improve on integration of agricultural systems. We need a strong feedback loop from the final consumer to markets and to production systems, including farming and uh, agricultural research. This integration is required to enhance the competitive advantage for all stakeholders involved in food systems. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. I think we have a lot to take away from that keynote address, especially around creating linkages to be able to strengthen the work that is being done and especially affecting rural areas. Right now, I'd like to bring on a video to set the scene. This is by Tom Kihu, the Deputy Director of Agriculture at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thanks for inviting me to say a few words about Strengthening Market Infrastructure Day. It's a topic I'm passionate about as I truly believe that many of the constraints that small scale producers face today are no longer solvable at the farm level. Due to the efforts of many organizations here at AJRF today, the basic building blocks of agriculture systems have been developed. New higher yielding seed varieties are being released every year. Distribution channels and the corresponding agro dealer networks have found their way across the continent. The input offerings have improved dramatically over the last couple of decades. While these still systems still need to improve and continue to develop, the challenge is no longer simply making inputs available to small scale producers, but rather making the economics of farming viable in an environmentally sustainable manner. This can only be done by focusing in on the market infrastructure. And this is where a lot more work is still needs to be done. Market infrastructure encompasses the food system's physical and institutional infrastructure. Physical market infrastructure is something we're all familiar with, such as roads, cold storage, urban markets. And it's the unfortunate nature of agriculture that all inefficiencies within a market are ultimately passed on to the farm. If freight costs are 30 metric ton dollars a metric ton higher than they should be due to poor road conditions, that cost is not absorbed by the processor and rarely is it passed on to consumer. It is ultimately the farmer who bears the cost and lower prices for her production. While physical market infrastructure is important, I also want to call out institutional market infrastructure, such as quality standards, contract integrity, price transparency, competition rules, and industry regulations. Without these, markets can simply not function in an efficient manner. And again, these inefficiencies are passed on to producers. So to help set the stage and in preparation for this session, I went back and reviewed the cost buildup of fertilizer price to farmers when I was a managing director for Cargill in Africa. While I estimate that our price for fertilizer to farmers could have been reduced by $60 a metric ton if freight costs were comparable to that of a developed world nation such as North America, Europe, I was surprised to find that $300 a metric ton could be attributed to poor institutional market infrastructure such as a national standard for low density fertilizer blend and poor contract enforcement mechanisms that added to the risk of financing small scale producers. So I encourage the panelists today to think not only of the physical infrastructure, but also the institutional market infrastructure that is required to build back a better world-class and sustainable food system. It's important that we relook at the ag markets and all of the systems that support it to ensure we are building the food system uh, that's required for the future. And as we look forward to the future, how do we ensure that we're building that sustainable system that allows, that allows the food to be safe, affordable, and nutritious, uh, what the poor are depending on? Thank you. Thank you so much, Tom, for uh, joining us in person. We really appreciate you taking out the time. I think taking away from that, it's very, uh, important that you've highlighted that infrastructure, um, including public goods, as well as institutional public structure, are the key mechanisms um, to unlocking the development of value changes, specifically in rural areas. 
So now we will be uh, going to our first panel discussion, uh, which is the strengthening mechanisms in processing logistics and market infrastructure. We have a, a series of panelists uh, in attendance today. We have um, we have Ms. Atzoka Toda, who's the Director of Agriculture Finance and Rural Development at the Department of African Development Bank, as well as Dr. Holge Cray, a practice manager of at Agriculture and Food Security at the World Bank. We've got a series of questions that I'll be asking uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Cray, as well as Ms. Toda. Um, so let's begin. Yeah, I think the first question that we would uh, we would like to cover is how can we improve the implementation of policies to boost regional trade? I think we can uh, put that to uh, Ms. Toda. Okay, Ms. Toda is uh, not present at the moment. She seems to be have a, a link issue. But we also have Mr. Ayodeja Balajan, the Chief Executive Officer of Afex Nigeria. Thank you so much for being Thank present you. and participating. And I think, yes, so I'd like to see if I can just put the first question, which is how can we improve the implementation of policies to uh, to boost regional trade? I think, let me put that to Dr. Craig. I thank you very much for having me um, on behalf of the World Bank at the, at the AGIF. Yes, Atsuka Toda was in this panel earlier, obviously got kicked off for a moment. I hope she'll be back in a moment, but let me, let me take this question because it's an intriguing one and I want to structure my my response to you into three segments. I want to very briefly talk about the key drivers we observe, B, about the key opportunities we see and draw lessons from it on where to best target policy. Uh, because my hypothesis will be that the, the policy targeting that we've seen in the past is not working any longer and that we need sort of a modernized set of, of policies. Key drivers that we observe these days two very positive drivers, but one concerning drivers. The positive drivers, very clearly, the demand for food and products from this sector, raw materials, but particularly processed products is increasing. Not every industry can say that of itself. The agri-food industry is in a very fortunate situation. The demand for its products increases on average by 3% a year. That's a very, very promising investment proposition for anybody who's involved in this sector. Second, the people as the most valuable asset, 20 million young people join the workforce every year. A significant share of them finds their livelihood within agri-food. And whereas I always say I cannot promise uh, livelihood for all of these entrants in primary agriculture, we see significant growth of employment, particularly in markets, marketing and processed goods, the very topic uh, of this session. If anybody tries to tell you that employment in agri-food will go down uh, in the future, that it is a declining sector, don't believe them. We see even in empirics, that the number of employees rises, not necessarily on the farm, but particularly in downstream, in processing, in commerce. I want to give you one example. In Tanzania alone, around entrepreneurial farmers, we currently see a job growth of 13 million wage labor days every year. And that is the entrepreneurial ecosystem around entrepreneurial farmers. What do I mean? It's the providers of fertilizer, of of pesticides, of seeds, insurance, banking services, mechanization services, and so on and so forth. This is very promising. A third driver, unfortunately, however, is a negative one. There's overwhelming evidence that extreme climatic events will be very disruptive to agriculture and agriculture value chains. And that trend is not declining, it's becoming stronger, whereas every 
in the past, we saw disruptions about every 10 years. We now see it about every two and a half years. Let me come to very concretely to the, to the question that you answered. Where do we best target policy interventions? We do see that particularly entrepreneurial farms, and that's irrespective of their size, but market connected farms show a lot of the traits that the minister was just talking about in her, in her initial address. In empirical work jointly done between the World Bank and Michigan State University with my colleague, uh, Tom Jane, we can clearly show that around entrepreneurial farms, some call them medium-sized farms or investor farms, we see much greater vibrancy of factor markets and input markets, but also product markets. What does that mean? It means these farmers are shown to increase in formal land acquisition, be involved more in formal mechanization, leasing or buying or yeah, leasing of services from either neighbors or service enterprises. But particularly, we see they enjoy improved market access conditions, which means they are closer to their markets. The relative distance to service provision be it advisory, but be it also for goods, declines. So they are closer to service provision. And finally, they report an increasing number of traders who compete for their products. What does all this mean in one sentence? The business environment for entrepreneurial farmers in many countries on the continent is empirically proven to be improving. And policy interventions must particularly focus on the entrepreneurial segment of the farming population. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you highlighted uh, very important points um, to really put meat to the session. I think it's very important that demand should drive the investment. And just highlighting that, the, you know, with the development of these value chains is going to be creation of jobs in rural areas, which solves a lot of issues. So thank you so much. I'd like to see if I can ask uh, Mr. Uh, Ayodeja Balogan, the Chief Executive Officer of FX Nigeria. Um, how can we get integrated value chains functioning more effectively in Africa? Thank you very much. Um, it, it, this is indeed something that is absolutely. So first, one of the things that we started to see and we promote is the infusion of technology in agriculture. Um, this brings two very important parts to the conversation. First, it enables us gather data and um, the right kind of data then helps you support farmers better. You can do credit ratings. You can cluster where surpluses and the market deficits are and then better serve that. Uh, but the other part of what data also does is it allows you to be able to scale because of the transaction efficiency it then brings. Um, so this is definitely around technology and the ability of using data and efficiency is one part to push. The second part that we also need to start looking at is strengthening the middle actors. Um, storage is a big gap. So if you look at storage um, across the BRICS, you'll find out that most of the country in sub-Saharan Africa have a storage capacity of less than 5% of total annual crop production. And if you compare that with the BRICS or other more developed economies, you see that they have between 75 to 125% storage capacity of the annual grain crops that they produce. What this allows them to do is to be able to better store larger volumes, uh, convert these commodities into financial assets, and then be able to react better when there are shocks like COVID, like climate change, like it changes in production pattern. But in Sub-Saharan Africa, when you can only store about two months of consumption uh, in the organized storage facilities that are available, then it's very difficult to organize the chain, both backwards and forward. Um, so infrastructure in storage is one thing that needs to be. And then when you look at the cost of this, it's one of those things that, um, you know, on the construction of a silo, uh, for grains cost about $300 per metric ton, uh, which is about a depreciation of about 12 to 15 years for it to make sense. Construction of a warehouse is about $60 per metric ton, uh, which also takes some time and is a high capex. When you look at um, what an average SME that plays this role of intermediation in agriculture does. Uh, so these are sort of the kind of facilities 
where you need to direct more development capital and more patient capital, and then allow private sectors to then build the superstructure that can operate it. Thank you. I think you highlighted one important uh, note to say the importance of infrastructure to build resilience, to be able to deal with changes in the market environment. I think that's very important in how we can be able to get these uh, value chains functioning more effectively, specifically in Africa. I'd like to put a, another question to Dr. Cray. Um, uh, in your opinion, and how is the, the private sector being incentivized, not just to play a key role in food security, but even in a bigger role in creating employment in rural Africa. I know you touched up on this a little bit more earlier, but I'd like for us to just go in a little bit deeper because it's, it's a very key question and how we're going to be able to make sure that uh, agriculture is a key driver of economic development in Africa. Yeah, Tato, I thank you for that question. I, if, if you allow me before I, before I respond to the question, how's the private sector being, being incentivized? Let me pick up on one, uh, one point that my, my predecessor, Mr. Balogun, just made the critical importance of fostering closer relationships between agro processors and downstream enterprises who acquire all the knowledge and the skills he was just talking about, because that's a complex system of entrepreneurial decisions he just outlined. And farmers who quite often are limited in their ability to think about these investment strategies, and that's irrespective of country. So fostering closer relationships between processors and smallholder farmers through so-called productive alliances is a critical part of any strategy. But Tato, I want to come back to your question, incentivizing the private sector. Let me remind all of us that agriculture is inherently one of the most private sectors we can think about. It's quite often being misunderstood because the agriculture is also subject to quite a bit of state intervention. But who are the actors, the economic actors in agriculture? Sorry for that complex sentence, economic actors in agriculture. I mean, who are the players? It's private sector enterprises. The farmer, she's a private sector entrepreneur. The person who usually buys, who usually processes, who usually markets in a city, down to the person who sells and consumes is private sector. So we must start all this with the premise of private sector thinking in mind. Now, rather than asking how is it being incentivized, I first want to ask the question, are incentives in place that perhaps disincentivize the private sector? And unfortunately, I have to say, yes, we still observe that in a range of cases. If Let's take the fictitious case of a country that for good reasons is concerned of food security and decides for years in a row to close its border to the export of a food staple, let that be maize. What does this usually lead to? It leads to lower prices in domestic markets that is intended for the consumer but what does that mean on the farmer side? On the farmer side, it quite often means lesser than expected prices, being disconnected from international markets, having lesser incentives to invest into productivity or storage solutions. And so quite often in the discussions I'm having, there's really this, this trade-off between trying to, yes, indeed, pursue bigger objectives, food security, climate resilience, uh, other sector development issues, and the question, are we perhaps disincentivizing the original objective? Are we compromising productivity just because we want to uh, achieve another objective? This is, this is tremendously important to, to make sure not to have unintended consequences. And I see Mr. Balogo nodding uh, almost violently in the background because see, the many entrepreneurs I talk to every day quite often say, see, if the government would just leave us alone or have lesser intervention, that would help us more than interventions with unintended impacts. Let me close by saying, see, I am a policy guy. 
I've dedicated my life to better agriculture policy. So I'm not negating the importance of policy. I want policy. I want good policy. We measure good policy through the enabling the business of agriculture index, EBA at the World Bank. But what, we, what I would like to see is the state as a facilitator and not as an actor in markets. The state is inherently not good as being a market actor, like buying, selling, producing, but setting in a regulatory environment, ensuring trust in quality, ensuring trust in payment solutions in markets. That is a role of a state and of public policy. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think you highlighted uh, key messages in that, that it should be uh, private sector led. And I think such platforms where we can be able to interact as policymakers and farmers, so it's a very good for to have that continuous communication so we can be able to build policies that are supportive. I'd like to ask uh, uh, Mr. Balogan one question, uh, just to close up our, our panel session. I think after this question, I'll leave it open to um, Mr. Cray and Mr. Balagan for closing comments. But just to put to you to say, um, what is being done in your environment, um, in your area uh, of expertise to build adequate infrastructure that will enhance, uh, enhance food logistics performance in your direct uh, you know, uh, uh, area or where you're operating? If you've got any insight or experience in that just share yeah thank you very much and all that I, I must say yes you are absolutely spot on um you know government innovation and the capacity to draw on capital to, to grow the sector. Um, in, our, in our experience and I'll talk from uh, our experience in AFEC so we were set up um, as a fully private funded, but a partnership with uh, private investors and the Ministry of Agriculture in 2013. It was at a time when uh, the government had just increased um, the dry season productions from one season in the country into two seasons for major staple crops, and they expected about 40% increase in production. And the question was, what happens when you increase production? Um, unintended consequences, like Olga mentioned, um, how do you manage storage? How do you manage avoid a price glut uh, because you didn't have more farmers trying to sell at the same time. So we then came in to set up a warehouse resource system and a commodities exchange and um, coal starts to provide that sort of room where you could convert that warehouse receipts, uh, that commodity into a financial asset, give the farmer 70 to 80% of the value, and then it waits to sell it as prices stabilize. And then you're also sure of more stable supply of food across the months of the year. Uh, when we were starting, uh, the first biggest challenge was uh, storage because it takes time to build storage, even if you had all the capital. Um, the government contributed seven warehouses that we started with. Um, it was total combined about uh, 15,000 metric ton at the time. Uh, uh, six years down the line today, we have 85 warehouses across 22 states, uh, total close to about 300,000 metric tons uh, capacity. Uh, and this is how you start to see things work. Today, we work with 250,000 farmers across eight crop value chains. And this is just a span of six, six years. Um, so again, this is sort of how government and the development partners can be more catalytic and um, embrace more uh, growth and um, unlocking capital from the private sector. Well, it sounds like you're doing really amazing work there and you've been able to, you know, get the right partners on board. I think that's very interesting, uh, you know, getting that PPE relationship going on, like we, we've been noting in the session the importance of partnerships, the importance of working together to be able to unlock those value chains. Um, I'd just like to leave the, the next uh, five minutes for closing remarks. Um, I just want to just check if we've got any questions that uh, can be put forth to our two panelists in our session um, here, where we, we are discussing uh, strengthening mechanisms and processing logistics and market infrastructure. Um, so while I check if there's any questions, uh, I don't know if uh, Dr. Cray, you've got any closing comments. Thanks for the opportunity for, for closing comments. 
Um, and Tato, I would like to use them to remind us jointly that uh, even though this session is a lot about infrastructure, that infrastructure is a most commonly misunderstood term. When we think of infrastructure, we quite often think of roads, storage, of buildings, and these are undoubtedly super important, but infrastructure is more. It's production infrastructure uh, on, I mean, field delineation, irrigation, production on farm. And we need to ask ourselves the question, sorry to rub that point in once more, is it resilient to a changing climate? Very soon we'll be publishing at the World Bank a piece of work that I think will shake up many readers because we show that the cost of inaction in this domain is 20, 30 times higher than the cost of action that governments would want to, want to take. Infrastructure around agro-processing. Let me not dwell on that because I talked about it. Infrastructure around technology and digitization. We didn't come to that because of the limitations of time. But see, we all know that investment into science and product research, R&D, research and development, is more effective than anything else. Every dollar spent, every euro spent, every currency unit spent pays off at least 10 times. And see, digital solutions already now reach tens of millions of farmers on the continent. Their potential is almost, like I would say, unlimited for better farming, for registration, certification, and traceability, something that our modern consumers increasingly want, but also for improved integrated administration and control by governments. And finally, there's trade infrastructure. And when I say trade infrastructure, I, again, don't necessarily mean a road and a port, but I mean the ability of countries to secure, to make sure that they comply with the rules that the continent now proudly has set for itself under the Comprehensive Africa Free Trade Agreement. And so just because this agreement is there doesn't mean that each and every country can successfully trade under it. So always the question, is the infrastructure in place to ensure that the statistical systems, the quality assurance systems, the information flows, the trade facilitation are in place to participate and take advantage of the huge opportunity of the free trade area. Tato, my closing statement here is, as you hear from my comments and as you hear from the comments of my peers, Agri-food is one of the most complex sectors. It takes much more than just like one ministry or one technical solution. Actually, 14 disciplines come together in making agriculture more successful. And so I call almost on entire government cabinets to maintain agriculture and food as a key priority and really align, orchestrate the efforts of more than just a ministry of agriculture around the very important objective of making agri-food systems work. Because as I said at the very beginning of my intervention, it's not only important because of the products it produces, the very much valued one, but because it is a main job producing sector and it is a sector that will determine the resilience of our countries, our landscapes and our villages in the unfortunate situation of a continent that experiences a changing climate. And we at the World Bank are very concerned and very much ready to work with governments around this mission. Thank you, Tato. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think you've, you've hit the, the nail on the head, you know, to, to, for us to be able to be creating these integrated value chains is really dependent on the development of the ecosystem. This includes the physical, the digital, the market infrastructure, especially in terms of, you know, supporting the development of agribusinesses. I'd like to bring in uh, Tom uh, Kehoe from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I'd just like to find out from Tom um, if his opinion around this topic, um, specifically, you know, um, the work that they've been doing at Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and, and as well as, you know, if you have any opinions or around issues, especially around, uh, around infrastructure and uh, development. Sure, thanks. Um, 
Yeah, I think Holder um, brought up some very valid points when we look at the infrastructure and, and more so like I said at the beginning, it's really not a matter of creating more of supply, but really trying to understand, can you actually deliver that supply at a cost effective price in an efficient market system? So really trying to understand what does the food system need to look like when we look at 2030, 2040, 2050, because we're building for that future, right? And how do we actually take that future demand, back that off into today's environment and understand what type of infrastructure we need to be in place. And more and more so, we need to look at the competitiveness of that infrastructure, because I'm a passionate believer that uh, Africa has the potential to, to be a, a player on the global markets. Africa has the potential uh, to really drive its agriculture forward. Simple things like when we look at uh, the size of a truck, a 15 metric ton truck is a very inefficient load when you're comparing it to other markets, other, other nations where 40, 42 ton trucks are the standard. So really just trying to look at the scale of the infrastructure, the effectiveness of the infrastructure and what is needed to make it happen. And like I said earlier, I think I passionately believe in that institutional infrastructure, the regulations, the rules of the game, the policies that are in place, so much inefficiency, so much risks are involved in those. And as we get into climate change and the challenges that are coming, um, it's going to be imperative that we really take a holistic approach to the risk profiles and get all actors around the table to understand not just the farms themselves, but the industry around the farms and how can we shield the, uh, the ag system to be more resilient than it ever has before. So I honestly believe that infrastructure and the markets themselves uh, is, is, needs to be the focus as we move forward over the next decade. Thank you, Tom, for that insight. Um, I, what I love about that is the, the forward-looking um, terms of development, not reacting to the current situation, but looking forward and seeing what is the potential for the future. I think that would be the way we can lay the pathway and to be, unlock the value within the agribusiness that are existing in the sphere. Um, I would like to just get Mr. Ayodeja's Balogan, the Chief CEO, of FX Nigeria, just to get his uh, closing remarks on the session. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the key things to here to say is to, it's not just the hard infrastructure, but also the soft infrastructures are extremely as important. The second is that uh, we need to find ways to better collaborate. So between the development partners, uh, the commercial capital providers and impact investment community, and then governments and see how we can bring in all our strengths to bear to de-risk the sector, uh, but leverage and be more catalytic in our interventions. Um, a lot of time I, do, I often see where um, there's sort of the too much focus on the soft issues and less on the big picture. Um, I think being able to bring in the different strengths of the three partners to solve this very important, probably the most important problem of food security for our, our generation uh, we'll have to deal with um, is very important for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the input, Dr. Cray, Mr. Balagan, um, Mr. Kihu, thank you for participating in the session. I think those that are, are here have a lot to take away. We've spoken about the different uh, key areas on, on this topic. I think just to take away from that, I think on top of the list, I think the, the, the importance of partnerships, working together, be it private sector, finance institutions, governments, coming together to come up with not only just policies and how to solve issues, but you know, mapping a way forward. Um, we, we spoke about the importance of infrastructure to build resilience. I think, uh, especially in an ever-changing environment, we're talking about uh, uh, agribusinesses that are de uh, working in developing environment, uh, economies, developing markets. Um, and with globalization, urbanization, there's a huge demand that, you know, Dr. Cray touched on to say demand is what's going to lead uh, uh, all these agribusinesses, you know, as people move into urban spheres, but also the demand for employment in the rural areas. How do we create that link between the rural uh, atmosphere to the urban sector? How do we make sure that 
that primary production is linked to the demand for processed goods in the urbanized space. And in between there is that is there the infrastructure, be it the physical, the roads, be it the, the machines, be it the, 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 the trucks, you know, but also when we look at the digital sphere to say there is so much potential in the digital sphere and we look at uh, various countries that have been able to unlock the power of the smartphone to be able to transact to be able to deal with markets. Um, so we, we, we really looking to forward to that digital boom that's going to support the, the, the processing uh, side. Um, so and then we, we, we can just close off to say that um, the way that we're going to get investment in, to, to develop all of this physical and non-physical infrastructure is the business case is the demand. And in Africa, we have the population, there is the people, not only in the African continent, but the potential to export. So thank you so much for those that participated in the session. We're now going to be going on to our next panel discussion. Um, and our panel discussion that we're talking about is strengthening ag value chains. I think this is very a very interesting session. Um, today, we, we have five panelists who will lead the discussion and share their experiences. I'm very excited because we have uh, Ms. Helen Onyango, a crop aggregator from Farm to Market Alliance. We also have uh, here Ms. Michelle Kagari, the Global Director of Government Relations and Policy from One Acre Fund. Thank you. Ms. Joe Ryan, um, CEO of True Trade. We have uh, Ms. Khadija Muhammad, the CEO of Kwanzaa Tukule. We also have in presence uh, Professor Edward Mabaya, uh, research of uh, international programs at Cornell University. Um, we also have Ms. Ashini Patel, uh, the program coordinator for Fund for Real Prosperity of KPNG. Um, before we begin, I would just like uh, Professor uh, Caesar, who was uh, uh, Professor Caesar Tambo, the Deputy uh, PS of the Ministry of Agriculture for the United Republic of Tanzania, um, just to you know give us his insight as we lead on to our next part uh, uh, panel discussion, strengthening ag value chain. So, uh, Professor Tambo. I'd just like to give you the platform to just give us your input. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I, I, I've, been, I've been a bit late to join um, the room. So can you give me a little bit of time? Uh, I listen a little bit and then uh, be able to contribute because I don't know what has expired, uh, what discussion went on. Uh, I was uh, attending another session, just for um, like five, 10 minutes. And then uh, I'll share some. Um, okay, thank you. Here. Thank you, Prof. <laughs> We've just finished our session around strengthening mechanisms and processing logistic and market infrastructure. Um, and we, we, we've just had various panelists giving us uh, insight around that. Um, you know, the reason why governments end up as active actors, sometimes due to the lack of guarantee that the investments will ensure in public goods, um, especially where small farm, smallholder farmers are most active participants in, in the market. Any thoughts on how these expectations could be met without crowding out the public sector? Um, I don't know if I got your questions, uh, your question very well. Um, I think, uh, but maybe, maybe let me just contribute what I, uh, my experience in the country. Um, also with the interaction with AGRA for some years now and what AGRA uh, have, has worked with us and what is going on. Uh, essentially, there is no way you can take out the private sector. And uh, for us, uh, we know, uh, because I'm working the Minister of Agriculture, we start, our first private sector is our, our smallholder farmer. That is our first one. But I know that uh, we normally consider traders, input suppliers and others to be the actual private sector. But we think that 
the first private sector is the is the farmer himself. Um, so if you start from that node, then uh, you uh, be able to, to 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 know the importance of the other players, the other players around the different uh, uh, nodes which are supposed to save the, the farm. Now, there is no way you can avoid input suppliers. No way. Uh, it's very, very important in, the, in, in, in supplying uh, inputs. Uh, you know, all the kinds of input, we don't need to mention them. Now, <clears throat> once the farmer has produced, you need an intermediary uh, in, 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 in our country we call it the primary market. There are those um, aggregators. Uh, uh, we, we, we consider them to be at the primary markets. You, we need them and we need to, to recognize them, their role and the financing that they need to be able to aggregate from our smallholder farmers. Then we, we, we are talking of the secondary markets those people who um, aggregate from a primary from the primary markets uh, some of them are the ones who export the product or they hold large milling systems or or processing systems in the country to to supply in the large markets say within or outside the country so those are also very very important um, as a private sector so the private sector, without it, uh, there is no way you are going to advance your agriculture any, in any, any, any country. But we need, again, the private sector uh, in, in terms of uh, infrastructure, the warehousing, um, uh, where you are going to store your products. In a, and you need, when you store your products, to, be, <clears throat> to meet the required qualities um, to avoid things like aflatoxins and, uh, and uh, again, um, impurities when you are aggregating from the primary markets or the, the, from the, the smaller farmers, um, <clears throat> cleaning, moisture content and other stuffs are critical. Mm -hmm. So the, <clears throat> the private sector role um, is just Im impossible to avoid and uh, we need to embrace it as much as possible. And again, I've forgotten another component which is critical, financing. Banks sometimes are left out of the equation or guarantee um, that uh, systems which provide uh, credit guarantee, they are also forgotten from the, the circle. So now, <clears throat> with the experience that we have worked, we came with the concept uh, which was brought in by Agra, consortium, uh, forming consortium. Uh, where by um, you start from the market, you go to the production and you look at the various players who are supposed to be connected. And sometimes you also you need um, a large scale farmer in an area connected to smallholder farmers, connected with the banks, connected with the, 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 the off takers, uh, connecting also the input suppliers so all of them, they form a, some sort of a consortium uh, whereby now you guarantee a smallholder farmer uh, market, but inputs and also guaranteed uh, uh, income. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think that's a good linkage um, between our two sessions. Um, where we, we really delved in the importance of having the private sector involved. I'd like to bring in Ms. Ashini Patel, the Program Coordinator for Fund for Rural Prosperity at KPMG. I'd like to ask you, how can we effectively deploy agricultural innovations and technologies to build more resilient agriculture value chain systems? Um, thank you so much, Dato. Uh, so maybe I can speak uh, on behalf of um, FRP and what the Fund for Rural Prosperity has done with our participants um, within our portfolio in terms of leveraging technology. Um, and so we found it continu uh, continually important, especially um, through COVID-19, 
to reach and engage with smallholder farmers through these technologies. Um, and a few of the examples that I would probably like to give are, um, you know, some of the participants have developed digital products through low cost um, digital platforms such as mobile banking. Um, and also digital sourcing models to link farmers to markets, uh, such as e-commerce platforms. Um, some of them have even used um, satellite data and machine learning technology in order to collect uh, useful information and useful data to provide customized input packages to smallholder farmers. Um, and then finally, probably an, an example that I can use here is that um, uh, technology has been leveraged, uh, such as um, mobiles and uh, WhatsApp groups to provide online trainings and to disseminate useful information relating to financial inclusion, uh, good agricultural practices, um, information regarding weather, um, and even health advice um, through, uh, through technology. So, you know, in addition to some of the um, uh, activities that have been going on with regards to uh, providing smallholder farmers access to finance, um, there is other additional um, services that have been provided uh, and have been bundled together to make it more cost effective for smallholder farmers. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really loving the topic of the development of digital innovations. I think it's been very key um, in this space to unlock value within the agribusinesses from the technical side to the market side. So thank you so much for your input. I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Michelle Kagari, the Global Director of Government Relations and Policy from One Acre Fund. Um, how are smallholder, smallholders building resilience and how can they be supported to better respond to crises. Um, thank you, Fato. Um, first, I will highlight some of the ways that smallholder farmers are building resilience, um, noting that building smallholder farmers' capacity to withstand shocks and stresses is central to building resilience food systems. Um, there are five ways um, in which farmers are building their resilience um, that we've observed as One Acre Fund. And the first is when they adopt agricultural practices that maximize productivity. Um, being able to cultivate diverse crops, reap rich harvests, minimize post-harvest losses, helps insulate farm income from agricultural shocks. Secondly, being able to save enough harvest from their previous season, which they can convert to cash and also feed themselves without relying on other means builds resilience. Their ability to accumulate savings as well as tradable physical and livestock assets such as agroforestry or dairy or chicken um, definitely supports um, helps them when they are crisis. Um, their ability to adapt to redistribute strategies to respond to a changing environment. For example, if they're able to secure another source of income um, to supplement um, what's, what they're harvesting um, will increase their ability. And finally, having support structures or social networks um, is key. We have found that the stronger the network um, smallholder farmers have, um, for example, if they're in um, cooperatives, um, then the higher the chances that the farmer can fall back on the social networks for support um, in times of crisis. Um, moving on to the next part of how can smallholder farmers be supported to better respond to crisis. Overarching this is really making sure that any interventions particularly um, target women farmers because they bear particular household burden around farming. Um, interventions also really need to be tailored to and target the youth. Um, they are a growing and large population within Africa who are currently significantly underemployed. Um, so having said that, um, there are several ways in which we can support smallholder farmers to better respond to crisis. And the first of these is by meeting their needs um, to increase farm productivity. 
This includes providing solutions that helps them access financing. This has been mentioned before um, to purchase farm inputs, improving their access to quality inputs, as well as access to information on the best farming practices that would maximize their yield while preserving soil health, and also that would help them reduce post-harvest losses. Um, so the organization I work with, One Acre Fund, which is a nonprofit social enterprise, um, is currently serving 1.3 million smallholder farmers across sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we provide them with small loans, physical delivery of farm inputs and training. And we have found that this empowers them to feed 20 million individuals, which is the number of the, of the farm households across East and Southern Africa. The second way we can support them is by helping them adopt climate smart farming practices um, and also by increasing incentives for them to adopt these practices. Um, so, for example, supporting farmers to adopt agroforestry and crop protection practices, um, adopting crops that will help improve soil health, for example, legumes, um, and making things like soil testing practices um, for better management of soil health more accessible and affordable to farmers. Thirdly, we can support farmers to access markets to sell their produce at good prices. And we can do this by continuing to invest in innovative digital technology that links farmers directly with aggregators who can secure better prices for their produce or to link farmers directly with the markets. Um, as well as providing logistics to help get their produce to market. Um, governments especially can additionally facilitate better access to the market by streamlining and reducing the costs for doing so. Um, this would include reducing taxes and other costs that present barriers for smallholder farmers to access markets, especially in urban areas, um, because rural areas tend to be far removed. Another way we can support farmers is by providing safety nets to them, um, such as crop insurance. Crop insurance can really help farmers weather poor harvests and adopt to a changing climate. Additionally, we can democratize and deliver access to inputs, technology, and finance in communities where markets have failed. Um, in particular, I'm talking about deploying precision agriculture data, for example, to smallholder farmers. This would help contribute to better farm productivity and build their resilience. When we talk about precision agriculture, um, private-public partnerships in particular are essential um, for effectively deploying agricultural innovations and technologies and to extend services to wider networks of farmers. Public partnerships can provide the financial incentives needed for the companies that are developing precision agriculture tools to ensure that low income populations can access their technology. And then finally, um, in times of crisis, as we've seen when the COVID pandemic hit, farmers need access to cash transfers and other very practical support services. Um, so one of the things that uh, we observed um, when COVID first hit last year um, and when governments were instituting lockdowns was a recognition that it was imperative to ensure that farmers could stay in business. Um, and we were, we were quite glad to see that farmers responded, uh, governments responded by making special arrangements to support farmers, including recognizing all actors in agriculture supply and value chains as essential workers um, and having targeted market opening and support for growth of innovations um, in a context of lockdown, such as e-commerce. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think what uh, we can take away for that is really the importance of developing mechanisms to unlock the value through smallholders and the importance of their contribution to the greater industry and how government and private sector needs to find ways to, to address how we can disseminate information, innovations and tools to support smallholder farmers. Um, I'd like to bring uh, Professor Edward Mabaya um, research of International uh, Programs at Cornell University um, to 
come and assist us here to see how can we streamline an intra-African food trade to move Africa from a net importer to a continent that can feed itself. I'm looking forward to your comments on that. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Tata. Um, before I get into the issue of trade, let me circle back a little bit, if you allow me, to this issue of uh, building resilience, because I think that's one of the things that we're all facing now. And I want to agree with all the previous panelists on some of the issues that we were highlighted. However, many times when I hear this conversation about building resilience, it's often talked about in big, broad spectrum ideas, whereas each different crisis that farmers face in Africa requires a very different and unique solutions. A farmer facing locusts in Ethiopia, a flooding in Mozambique, Fulami, Zimbabwe, COVID all of Africa, all these people require different solutions. Um, and we heard from the previous panel, Holger Cray uh, from uh, World Bank mentioned this big looming threat of climate change, which I view to be one of the biggest challenges facing the continent. All these different things call for very different solutions to me. One of those solutions that I think is near and dear to my heart is that to allow these smallholder farmers to adapt, they need to have better technologies. And one of those most critical and affordable technologies is improved seed. We're talking now about digital innovations. We're all excited about what this software space offers to smallholder farmers. But perhaps the best software that a smallholder farmer can get is getting a maize variety that is resistant to drought, to uh, bean variety that's resistant to flooding, you know, um, wheat variety that's resistant to rust, uh, to, to rust. All these different technologies can be deployed to smallholder farmers and smallholder farmers can use these now without requiring new uh, hard infrastructure, without requiring new know-how, they are embedded. The work that the breeders are doing needs to find its way to the smallholder farmers so they can do their work better. I happen to work with the African Seed Access Index where we're evaluating how can we get these unique solutions uh, through the form of improved seed? How can we get them all the way out to reach the last mile and reach smallholder farmers in the rural villages? And that's quite an amazing space, which I might get to back, back to a little bit later on. But circling back to your question, how can we uh, get this uh, Africa free continental trade moving? And how can we kind of convert all this money that we're spending on, uh, on food exports into uh, local production? First of all, let me say there's quite a lot of excitement now about what the potential of Africa continental free trade agreement offers for many along the value chain. But I want to caution here that the devil is in the detail. Yes, there's going to be many benefits that are going to uh, you know, manifest over time. But I want to caution on some of those uh, uh, you know, kind of de de details. So beyond infrastructure itself, to get trade moving in Africa, we're going to need basically the guy with the truck. And let me not say the guy, uh, the man or woman with the truck. You know, this is really the heart of trade within Africa, you need somebody who actually can move these products from one place to another. We also need some kind of standardization of grazing standards. What we call a grade A tomato in Malawi is different from what we call it in Zimbabwe or within East Africa. So it's gonna be very important, very difficult for us to promote trade within Africa, unless we can agree on what we call a commodity. So we need to be able to talk with the same language and get all those things together. Lastly, we need to close this gap between policy implementation, policy uh, plans and the implementation. Too often we sit on big panels like this and we have strong commitments from the highest levels of government. I'm delighted that here we have very strong representation here from government. But as everybody knows, there is a gap between what we plan to do versus the implementation itself. I would like to see more and more emphasis be placed on the implementing agencies that are often lacking capacity in many African countries that can actually deploy these new solutions that we're talking about, that can actually open up borders and create opportunities uh, for trade. If we do all these things well, that $50 billion food import that Africa is facing can be converted through by improving competitiveness of local agroecology agro systems serving smallholder farmers. I'll stop there and I'll circle back later on. Thanks, Hunter.
Thank you so much. I, I, I just want to link that um, with the question that I'm, I would like to ask Ms. Helen Onyango. The, uh, she's a crop aggregator from Farm to Market Alliance, as well as uh, Ms. Joe Ryan, the CEO of True Trade. I'd like to, you know, join two questions together, just to say, uh, how do we rechannel this 50 billion rand spend on food imports every year to building local capacity to produce our own food? I think I'd like to start with uh, Ms. Onyango. Um, you know, you're a crop aggregator. What are your thoughts on this? Hi, thank you. Thank you for that question. So personally, I'm a crop aggregator. I deal with smallholder farmers. My bit is mostly on the planting bit and the off-taking bit. So from my own personal experience, I, I, I believe that if we can have partnerships, you see a lot of money is going outside, but in Africa itself, you have the capacity to produce all this food. So what, what are we doing wrong? That is actually the question. So from my own personal point of view, I think we need to have a partnership strategic ones. You see farmers, like the, the other panelists has just said that the biggest change maker is about having improved seeds and certified seeds, because this one is going to be actually the, the least thing we can do and it is the one with the biggest return. So if me as a farmer, I'm a smallholder farmer, I can access the seeds, they're, they're improved and they're certified. Definitely my produce, I'm going to be producing better. And another thing is about crop insurance. As, as a smallholder farmer, I put in everything at once to farming, everything. So when I have losses, I can't actually go back to anything else. It's a total loss. So meaning that the next season I'm going to go on a hungry stomach, my kids can't go to school, I cannot even sustain myself. So if all this money can be put into insurance, maybe insurance players can come and we try to channel some of this money into giving smallholder farmers insurance. So you find that the farmer has a cushion I'm going to go in confidently and comfortably knowing that if nothing, if things don't go or don't go okay, maybe the extreme weather patterns like in Western Kenya, most of the time nowadays due to climate change, we are facing floods. So if there are floods, I'm cushioned. So I'm going to go in comfortably knowing that if it doesn't happen, there's someone who has my back and is going to refund me for the loss that I've incurred. Because if there's no one to, to refund me, then definitely we are going to keep on importing, 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 because there's always going to be a deficit. Another thing is on building our knowledge and skills transfer. You'll find that we are still not at the same pace with other change makers in other continents. We are still far back. I, I can't go to my farm as I'm a crop aggregator. There are some technologies like uh, the sensor when you're trying to tell even a simple farmer, can we try and irrigate? They are not aware of this. They don't even have the, the money, the capacity to think in that line. So we find ourselves so disadvantaged when it comes to technology and skills and knowledge, we are a bit backward. And of course there are companies who are trying to bridge in this gap, but it's not enough. Because we are trying to imagine that every farmer has a smartphone. Okay, I have a smartphone, but what about the, the bundles? How, how is this farmer going to actually afford this thing? So we need to actually go back and think in terms of uh, technology, are we doing enough are these things actually working for this farmer and if they're not working what can we do to try to bridge that gap uh, another thing will be on government policies a government needs to start uh, supporting smallholder farmers there just needs to be rules and regulation like now you'll find that the cost of production is here and right the prices of these goods it's still here and yet this is the same government that is just sitting there in place and saying that we have to produce more. How, how, is, how, how am I going to be motivated to produce when the cost of production is way, way higher than uh, the, the cost of production is way higher than the price I'm going to sell this thing. So as a farmer, I, I find myself at crossroads because most of the time I'll just resort to not, not, doing things, not doing this at all because there are no policies in place to protect me as a smallholder farmer to safeguard my interest. And actually the rules, policies actually need to be made on imports and exports because you find that most of the time as smallholder farmers, we go through so much. You find that, uh, for example, producing maize in Kenya might be way expensive than producing it in country X, your neighboring country. So you find that due to policies and everything, 
our manufacturers are opting to go out and get the maize instead of buying for, from us. So we find ourselves at crossroads, like I have the maize, so where am I going to take it? So regulations, policies and rules just need to be put in place to, to help the farmer actually understand what needs to be done. And again, market, we need to be certain and more predictable on the markets because we have the capacity to produce. But what is making us not producing? What is making us, what is making Africa go, go to different countries to import and all that? Simply because we have the capacity, but we are not guaranteed of the market. Can there be just a market that is more predictable, more guaranteed? And I know how much quantities Africa as a producer, I, I'll, I'll know how much quantities company X needs at what prices and uh, at what time so I can plan better and uh, just do everything in line so that when the time comes, I'm actually in line with whatever needs to be done instead of us just sitting because I am aware of what I need to do. And at the, at the end of the day, we end up just buying from other countries and yet we have the capacity simply because the market is not predictable. It's not certain. You're just there. One day someone comes in and says, I, I want 500 metric tons of beans from where? You never told me before so that I could plan and plant for that. So because simply I do not have, you are going to say that you can't give me this, so I have to go to country X. So can there, the market, can it just be predictable and a bit more certain? So let me stop at that. Thank you so much, Helen. I think you brought it back to reality to say, you know, you dealing with the farmers on the ground, you understand the challenges. And I think, uh, you know, there can be all the policies, but how is this information being disseminated to the ground, to the people that are actually, you know, there every day dealing with all the challenges, being environmental, being socioeconomic. I'd like to bring in Ms. Jo Ryan in, um, the CEO of True Trade. I uh, know she's, she's a social uh, entrepreneur, linking small holders to farmers. I'd just like to get your insights and how are, how are small holders, you know, going to be to, to create this resilience that is needed to be able to be able to get into the sphere where we where smallholders are interacting in integrated uh, value chains. Um, thanks, um, and good afternoon. I'm I'm not in a very good network area, so I'm keeping my my video off. So similar, just to follow on from from the previous speaker, um, I think there's two issues. So what we do in two trade is we aggregate from smallholder farmers on behalf of buyers. And we are fully transparent. We pay the smallholder at farm gate. We do not, sub, do not subcontract them. It's basically a willing buyer, willing seller model. But our biggest learning is really, um, our biggest learning is there is a mismatch between policy and implementation for sure, and also for what the market needs and what we are producing. And I actually really come from the market side. And I, every day I get, I get, I get from buyers, they cannot find the projects. And then you hear smallholders cannot find the market. And it's a complete mismatch. So I'm going to give two examples, two value chains. So I'm going to bring it down to very Pacific. So I'm based in Kenya and I work in the soya bean market value chain, which is we're just coming towards the end of the soya bean season at the moment. I have a buyer, a commercial buyer, giving a very fair price, looking for a thousand metric tons of soya bean that we had a contract with to deliver. And we went out to Western Kenya and we told the farmers way in advance that this was happening to plant in March, to plant certified seeds, we get the market confidence. In Kenya, we've managed to offtake about less than 20 metric tons. And it's not because our price is unfair, it's because it's not there. Farmers simply have not planted. In Uganda, which is well known for soya bean, most of the soybean this year in Uganda, I saw it myself in Lira, trucks and trucks drove down to Basia, over the border, over to Mombasa and off to India. Because India had a shortage of soybean this year because I, I don't actually know why, but I think it's something got to do with climate change. So in that and to the previous speaker, um, I know governments don't intervene, but in fairness, in this case, it's a pity that the soya ended up going to Mombasa. While at the same time, you have Zambia banning the export of soya bean, which is a big source of soya bean for Kenya. So basically, Kenya does not produce enough soya bean itself. And now this season is short. What does that mean? What does that imply? 
many animal feed producers are going out of business because they cannot get the soya, right? What's it going to mean for the industry in Kenya? Already is happening. Um, 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 dairy, dairy feed has gone up. The price of dairy feed, the bag of dairy feed has already gone up. The price of chicken feed has gone up. Next thing, the price of eggs is going to go up. The price of pig feed is going up. And this is not me just saying this is true trade. This is the, the Kenya Association of Animal Feeds have put out alert about this. So this is one instance. Another example is the rice value chain. So the rice value chain in Uganda, for example, the price has very much dropped in the last two months. It is because Tanzania puts their excess of rice into the Uganda market. OK, but at the same time, Kenya continues to buy over a million dollars of rice every month or it could be every two weeks from Pakistan. Now, if Kenya went and bought the excess rice from Tanzania, at least we keep it in the region and the price of rice in, for smallholder farmers in Uganda would stay stable. So I, that's just two examples. I can give you many more. So I just think when we talk about building the resilience of smallholders, yes, certified seeds, hugely important. Agri inputs, hugely important. Finance, hugely important. But we also must look at the market. And we have market confidence. We just don't have, we have this absolute mismatch of what farmers are producing and what the market needs. And then as a region in East Africa, we have a mismatch between the countries. Thank you so much, Joe. We, you highlighted very important uh, topics based on your experience, really creating that, that, that linkage between the smallholders as well as the markets. And also highlighting how environmental changes as well as, you know, you know, any challenges have play a role in this. I'd like to bring uh, forth uh, uh, Ms. Khadija Mohammed Churchill, uh, CEO of Kwanzaa Tukule. And uh, she's running a startup um, where she's using technical innovations and advancements to solve societal problems sustainability, uh, sustainably. Um, I'd like to get um, Ms. Khadija's uh, opinion around this topic and really through the work that you have done um, on the ground, how are you, you know, creating these solutions using the digital sphere? Thank you. Um, my name is Hadija Mohammed Churchill. I am the founder and CEO of Kwanzaa Tukula Foods. Um, Kwanzaa Tukula Foods, we, in, we distribute food in the low income areas in Nairobi. Um, so, in, in the areas of um, ensuring there is affordable and accessible food, which is our mission for the low income, low income dwellers, um, we use technology. We have um, an app that we use where vendors, we primarily deal with food vendors. Food vendors are critical access points for food in informal in settlements. So what we do is we ensure that we um, supply staple food products to food vendors who then um, cook or sell it to um, the people that live in, in the community. Um, how we have leveraged technology um, in, in, in the ways that we, uh, our customers are able to place their orders using their phones, um, they can use an app and say what they want, and then we will then deliver on a regular basis. So daily, in this case, um, we will. We are also able to harness the data from from the um, from the customer information that that is required um, to to be able to deliver. So with the data that we have, we can predict supply. Um, we can therefore. Um, test new different products with the customers and get feedback immediately as to whether we can stock it or, or we sh should we stock it or should we not stock it. Um, so that's, those are the ways in which technology has, has sort of made our work easier, if, if, if you like. Um, and on the wider topic of making, um, on the wider topic of resilience, especially from, from um, the production side of food. I think a number of topics have been discussed. Um, there are numerous levers that, that 
one can pull. Technology is obviously one of them um, in terms of um, one of the speakers spoke about data. Uh, data is really critical in, in, in the situations that we're in because we are then able to sort of uh, prioritize the limited resources that we have. Um, so it, it's, technology is critical in, in that sense. Um, infrastructure is also important. You can see um, numerous challenges that have been discussed in terms of sourcing for products. Um, so infrastructure with regards to roads, um, mechanisms to distribute food, mechanisms to reduce post harvest losses, which really impact the pricing of, of food, especially for people who can't afford food. Um, infrastructure in terms of also um, developing warehouses and storage, storage facilities so that we're able to um, take advantage of economies of scale. One of the things that Kwanzaa Tukule has been able to do so efficiently is um, we are able to, um, using economies of scale, again, able to bring the cost of food down for our food vendors to the level that you would find in affluent areas where you have big supermarkets supplying products. So we can be able to reduce the inefficiencies that exist in the market. Um, the other things that we could talk about is capital. Capital is really important. So Kwanza Tukule is a startup where we are, we've grown ourselves um, by bootstrapping our, our, our revenues, but in effect to raise capital is really difficult for startups, especially based in Africa. So the private sector is able or willing to solve this problem, but capital has to flow in the right places to almost wheel, uh, grease the wheels, if you like. Um, then the other thing I want to talk about is, uh, in relation to capital, is increasing the shelf life of products is really important. Um, so for, for entrepreneurs or startups or private sector, ability to increase the shelf life and investment in those areas. Packaging especially is quite expensive. Um, increasing shelf life is quite expensive for, for companies to invest in. So policies that will engender and sort of um, breathe life into those kind of um, activities, especially in the private sector, would really help in, in, when it comes to food security and ability to, to be resilient in difficult circumstances. Thank you so much, Khadija. I think one of the major things you touched on is the importance of data. Having information that's gonna equip producers as well as markets on the need and the demand of production. And also with planning production and trade investments. I mean, I think if we have that data, that richness of data within the African sphere, there will be better communication, it will be better partnerships within the value chain. I'd like to go back to Ms. Ashin Patel the program coordinator of the Fund for Rural Prosperity at KPMG. And uh, just to get your, 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 your remarks around um, how do we strengthen these uh, value chains? Uh, how do we create access uh, to uh, these producers uh, to, you know, in terms of finance, in terms of inputs, in terms of market capacity? Um, thank you, Tato. Um, so I just wanted to also uh, add that, you know, as part of the Fund for Rural Prosperity, uh, our participants are inherently part of the agricultural value chain, supporting smallholder farmers. Um, and uh, the way they uh, assist these smallholder farmers is through access to finance, through a different combination of financial products, input to credit, agricultural advice, um, training and offtake. Uh, and so far, you know, we've been uh, we've managed to reach about five million beneficiaries from an initial target of about one million beneficiaries, um, and also been able to support them through capacity building. So um, we've uh, so far managed to build capacity and provide support to about three hundred and twenty thousand beneficiaries across sub-Saharan Africa. However, um, there's still obviously more to be done. And one way in which we could possibly do this is through, um, and what's being done is through the decentralization of activities um, as they engage with smallholder farmers, for example, 
um, in, by including more members of the community, by organizing them into smaller groups, and um, by doing so, being able to train um, many more farmers and to provide a lot more capacity building support to these smallholder farmers. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to add in terms of, um, you know, agricultural value chain innovation, it sort of goes hand in hand with financial innovation. And so, you know, no, no doubt uh, mobile money has been a key driver of this, but there are other ways in which um, the participants, especially as part of the FRP program, um, have added benefits, um, for example, through extending additional financial products. Um, to provide uh, smallholder farmers with more financial freedom. Um, this could be in the form of um, input financing to pay for a range of other commodities um, for themselves, or by bundling, say, credit products with insurance, which would thereby you know, support smallholder uh, farmers and cushion them against the, the, the shocks that we've seen, um, especially in the last few years, uh, COVID-19, um, locust invasions, floods, droughts, etc. So um, I just uh, basically wanted to say, you know, in order to continuously um, support and strengthen the agricultural value chain, it's important to extend that support to the players within the value chain um, that uh, uh, support the smallholder farmers, that provide access to finance, and of course, access to, to inputs and uh, markets as well. So uh, thank you for that opportunity and back to you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Patel. I, I, just leading on from that, I'd just like to bring in Ms. Michelle Kagari. You know, as the global director, specifically on government relations and policy, I understand you, you advocate for inclusion of the unrepresented voices in governments and policy development. How are we, as an African continent, going to, you know, take this spend, let's say, you know, you've got, have you got any ideas of this, you know, 50 billion spend on food imports? How do we challenge, challenge that back to realistic implementation on the ground? I, I'd just like to get your thoughts on that. Um, thank you, Thato. Um, the other speakers um, have spoken about like the mismatch that we have in terms of the environment, the policies, and the realities on the ground. Um, for me, that would be one of the priority areas to bring alignment um, to between the market and the policy environment. Um, we really need to be capitalizing on our population growth, the urbanization and the strong demand for global food um, by increasing the yields of major food crops. Um, I think Joe mentioned that um, regionally, even if we've got the East African community, we are still not able to leverage um, the, the, common, the common market that's created by the East African community to ensure that we are maximizing productivity and also that we are maximizing the markets that exist regionally. Um, also definitely increasing the investment in research and development. Um, as Professor mentioned, definitely access to quality inputs, quality seed that um, respond to the changes in climate is key. Uh, making sure that we democratize access to technology. So again, access to the data that um, precision agriculture is providing and which farmers in higher income farmers are already able to benefit from. Um, and then really in improving like the infrastructure that we have to reduce the post harvest losses, um, in, including by increasing infrastructure to improve um, storage as well as other farm infrastructures. Thank you. Thank you so much panelists. I think we've, we've had a very great panel. Um, right now I'd like to uh, bring in uh, Dr. Joseph DeFries, the president of the Seed Systems Group. Um, I think this is, we, we have a lot of panelists that touched on uh, uh, seeds and genetics. Um, he's got a PhD in plant breeding and genetics from Cornell University. And uh, I, I would just like to get your, your, your comments uh, around the, you know, agri-system development uh, enterprises. Thank you very much, Tata. And I want to say it's been great hearing about the innovations and progress being made around uh, 
uh, a number of countries in Africa. But if you've attended number, a number of these gatherings on African agriculture, you will all know that we usually tend to end up talking about the same group of African countries, which tend to be popular with donors, while sort of conveniently ignoring the many other African countries where agriculture is also the basis of the economy and farmers have these same needs. And so if you don't mind, I'd like to share a few uh, slides and some data uh, to make the case that really now is the time to extend at least the benefit of improved seed uh, to all of Africa's farmers. I hope you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen clearly. Great. So if you look at uh, what has happened in some of the countries which have benefited from the development of seed systems, you will see that increasing the supply of improved climate resilient seed is very tightly correlated with increasing crop yields. And this is the case uh, in most recently in Uganda and Ethiopia. And uh, we did a bit of a study uh, here at Seed Systems Group to compare 10 countries uh, in Africa, which have received uh, ample assistance to develop seed supply among smallholder farmers with 10 countries which haven't received that kind of assistance. And we found a major gap in crop yields, in fact, between those countries that have been the beneficiary of improved seed and those which have actually uh, been left behind. And this has been most recently reported in Science Journal in June uh, of 2021. I wanna make the point as well that we now have improved climate resilient crop varieties for virtually every agroecology in Africa. And this is thanks to the generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, where I used to work at a USAID and, and several other bilateral donors. And this is a situation we haven't really had in our, in our favor before here in Africa. Equally important, we really now have an effective public-private model for getting the seed of improved varieties and related technologies to farmers, starting with crop breeding to you're, you're development of seed Martin. companies, uh, farmer awareness development, uh, extending the supply of seed right down to the farmer uh, through agro-dealers. Agra has taken this uh, approach to the next level by developing an integrated consortium model for inclusive agricultural transmit transformation, which brings together seed and input suppliers, plus grain buyers and food processors, and really involving the whole ecology of uh, agricultural actors. And as a result, Africa in a number of countries has made real progress in recent years. Today, in many of the countries that I'm showing in this uh, map of the continent, you see high yielding climate resilient varieties being developed and released, uh, seed companies producing the seed of those varieties, agro-dealers getting them out into the countryside, and crop yields, as we've already seen, are increasing. And out of that uh, production of surpluses by smallholder farmers, you see structured commodity markets growing in size. But many countries and millions of farm families have effectively been left behind in these sorry, sorry, Joe, sorry to interrupt you. Um, yes. uh, may you please uh, put your presentation on? We can see your computer. I think you just need to put the present slide because you, you, you're you talking on slides that we, we can't see. We only see the first one. Okay, I'll try again. I think just to put it on present and then we'll be able to see that. Thank you, Doc. Can you see that now? 
Yes, we see the, the current slide with the map. Yes, perfect. Thank you, Doc. Okay, I was saying that uh, in a number of countries, uh, agriculture has made real progress. And uh, uh, you see farmers getting higher yields and crop yields uh, and, and, and growing markets for the production of that surplus. But in many other countries, uh, whole uh, nations of farmers have effectively been left behind. And these are countries where, af where agriculture is also the basis of the economy. I'm talking about roughly a third of the population of Africa and almost half of its landmass. Current trends in these countries are quite alarming. Uh, the average rate of poverty is over 50%, and the average rate of child malnutrition is nearly 40%. Meanwhile, population growth annually is about 3%. So in 2019, Seed Systems Group and Cornell University conducted a broad feasibility study of how we could get seed and other improved inputs to farmers in these countries that have so far been left behind. And we found that the leadership in these countries is actually very enthusiastic about moving forward. They realize at this stage that they've been left behind and are eager to make up for lost time. We also went to the field and saw many scientists and entrepreneurs who are interested in getting seed to farmers, but they're working with very little support from outside. And so we've developed a five-year comprehensive plan for sustainable supply of seed to smallholder farmers in these countries, uh, individualized according to their needs. And uh, this is now ready for implementation. It's not a crazy idea. In fact, we're already getting started with support from EFAB. We've begun this work in four greater Horn of Africa countries, including South Sudan, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. And so we're calling on all donors to join in building back better as we emerge from COVID-19 pandemic in Africa by extending the benefit of improved climate resilient seed to all African uh, countries and all Africa's farmers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. DeFries. I think that was a very um, informative uh, presentation that you put forth. We thank you for the work that you have done in bringing you know, the seed technology, which is one major component in the value chain. Um, in wrapping up the session, I'd just like to get some closing remarks um, from some key speakers. I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Tom Kehoe for any closing remarks. Can we keep it to at least one minute each? Thank you. Thank you. I just want to appreciate all the panelists who um, participated today. I think uh, it, it really demonstrated the importance of making efficient market structures to be able to ensure that small scale producers are getting access to the seeds they need, getting access to the markets they do. I especially enjoyed the sessions from um, the value chain panel. And really those are the, the champions of the systems who are really fighting day in, day out, really trying to make these market works. And they know better than all of us, the challenges that are faced and the volatility and the things that happen. And the importance of really trying to come together and making sure that the policies are in place, the incentive structures are in place to really make sure African agriculture reaches its potential. So my hat's off to them and really appreciate all the hard work everyone is doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kiho. I'd like to bring in uh, Ashini Patel to give your closing remark. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so just to summarize in terms of um, the market players within the agricultural value chain, it's really important to be able to support all the market players, um, all the way from the smallholder farmers to the, um, to the um, uh, organizations that are pro uh, providing um, input to finance, input to um, access, sorry, access to finance and access to, to markets as well, in order to strengthen the entire value chain. Um, and also ensuring that 
uh, through that, we're able to leverage on technology and to ensure that innovation flourishes within uh, the, the, the agricultural value chain. So thank you very much, I'll back to you. Thank you. I'd like to just get uh, Prof. Ed Mabaya just to give us some closing remarks. Uh, thanks, Tato. I would like to say that I'm about 50 years old and uh, throughout my entire life, I feel like we've been addressing the same challenges of getting Africa's agriculture moving. If you went back you know, to 1973, you'd probably hear a lot of the same things that we're discussing here today being discussed there. But what I want to say is that there is a new sense of hope. We are making progress. It's hard to see sometimes, but progress is being made across the continent with significant investments, increasing productivity. The challenge is that this target is moving. It's a moving target. The population is growing. We have climate change. We have a host of other issues that are coming to play that requires to always recalibrate our solutions. That's why it's important that when we convene every year at an event like this, we rethink, are we still doing what is required for now? Because the solution from yesterday is likely going to be different from the solution getting into the future. Thanks, Tato. Thank you so much. Uh, I was going to bring more panelists in, but we are short of time. I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the session. I think we've got a lot to take away. We've highlighted the need for collaborative and strategic partnerships um, that are going to build pathways to recovery and especially a resilient food system in Africa. So thank you. God bless and have a, a lovely day.